Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, 3D Dilemma of this Century, presented by Natalie Rasgon, Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, Obstetrics and Gynecology, Director, Center for Neuroscience and Women's Health, Stanford University School of Medicine. I'm Alexis Krauss of Labyrinth, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots. Labroots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your question into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen, or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credit. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rasdon. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Okay, great. So, uh, hello everyone. My name is Natalie Rasgon. I'm a professor of psychiatry and uh, obstetrics and gynecology at Stanford School of Medicine. And today we will be talking about the uh, salient issues uh, pl plaguing our societies uh, in the developed world and in uh, all over the world, actually, which are the main somatic and uh, neurological diseases of the 21st century. Those are dementia, diabetes, and depression. Uh, without talking necessarily about the uh, prevalences and, and some kind of a statistical numbers, I want to dive right in into discussion of the common mechanisms which underlie all these three illnesses. And we're, of course, all aware of the costs enormous cost to society and individual, uh, as well as families associated with uh, having one or uh, more than one of these illnesses. So the mechanistic explanation behind the development of major illnesses all boils down to the concept of stress and uh, effects of stress uh, on the uh, various systems in the body. Stress is a word which has been used uh, very colloquially for a very long time, but it has a very strong uh, biological uh, foundation and very uh, innate and complicated uh, ways of addressing various processes in um, individual systems and then in the body uh, as a whole. So this slide uh, on the potential pictorial of how the stress may affect various systems is uh, truly a kind of a 30,000 mile view of the uh, major life events such as, for example, trauma or abuse versus environmental stressors which could range from the working environment to the socioeconomic status such as poverty, or um, being in a war zone, or um, having an adverse uh, upbringing in the childhood, to the physiological responses, which all, of course, stem from the brain and affect individual target organs. The concept of accumulation of these negative uh, stressors or influences along the life is known as a concept of allostasis. And the allostasis is the process in which certain events affect the body and then do not necessarily completely go away. So hence the notion of the allostatic load or as experiences which mount in, in, in each individual. The appropriate way of management of stress is called adaptation. And so the, what we will be looking is as maladaptive ways uh, the body and specifically the brain, the central nervous system and um, main diseases affecting it, 
respond to stress. So, um, there are a number of major, major mechanisms which are well known to uh, neuroscientists, to uh, psychiatrists, neurologists, and um, internal medicine specialists, and those are the kind of a clusters of diseases of the brain. And those are associated with maladaptive function of cognition, of emotional regulation, and they, they could be mediated by the exact same mechanisms, such as, for example, inflammation or cortisol toxicity with excess production of cortisol, the oxidative stress, and the metabolic dysfunction, which we will talk today in more detail about. And same exact uh, mechanisms underlie not only diseases, as I said, of the central nervous system of the brain, but also metabolic disorders such as diabetes or obesity, immune diseases, and cardiovascular disease. So the main pathophysiological condition, uh, which is at the center of these illnesses and pathological conditions, is called insulin resistance. So I will be spending some time in trying to dispel the notion of what insulin resistance is and how it might be um, a very pertinent and um, modifiable risk factor in treating diseases of central nervous system. So as you can see on this slide, insulin resistance is uh, well established in various illnesses from polycystic ovarian syndrome to obesity and um, various other issues. Of course, what we do know well is that one of the most known outcomes of standing insulin resistance is diabetes, but in truth, it's only one of the major diseases, but independent of that, insulin resistance can lead to depression, can lead to dementia, and can lead to cardiovascular disease. So I will skip that slide and go straight to the definition of what insulin resistance really is. It's a condition in which tissue responsiveness to the normal action of insulin is impaired. And what it truly means is that the peripheral or central insulin receptors are not sensitive enough to bind the circulating amount of insulin, and therefore there is uh, an insulin free insulin, unbound insulin to the receptor circulating in the system. That is, uh, in many ways, a condition which may be leading to the hyperglycemia eventually, but may be uh, con a condition which affects an individual for years or decades prior to evolving further. One of the important things for clinicians in the audience would be that uh, the insulin resistance may or may not be a consequence of weight gain. And so the notion which is uh, widely entertained in the uh, various clinical disciplines right now that obesity equals diabetes equals insulin resistance is really not correct. So, and we'll talk about that later. So these are the, uh, again, a pictorial uh, mechanisms of how, what happens in the various target organs when insulin resistance occurs. So the adipose tissue is one of the most um, important target areas in the body, which is responsible for production of free fatty acids. Free fatty acids decrease the insulin action, and that could be mediated into three um, different tar peripheral targets. One is the skeletal muscle. The other is another type of adipose issue, which could be an abdominal adiposity, or what we call a central adiposity. And the third is liver. Regardless of the target, eventually there is a decreased production of glucose uh, in terms of being actively utilized, inhibition of the lipolysis, and increased glucose output. So in overall outcome, there will be spilling glucose in the blood, what was known as a hyperglycemia, 
and uh, dyslipidemia. What is uh, fascinating and not as well known as the condition of insulin resistance, which had been coined by recently um, departed uh, Gerald Reven, who was our Stanford professor of uh, endocrinology, which was coined by him about 30 years ago as Syndrome X. But the insulin resistance independent of periphery occurs in the central nervous system, and that is uh, much less examined at this point in humans. However, there are a number of studies which suggested that uh, there is a correlation between the depression and the condition of insulin resistance, keeping, of course, in mind that in humans we do not measure insulin resistance in the brain per se, but assessing it as a central correlate of peripheral insulin resistance. So the high prevalence of depression in patients with primary insulin resistance, such as, for example, polycystic ovarian syndrome or prediabetes, or in diabetics, as we know, which is a long-standing, of course, condition of insulin resistance, there is about 60% prevalence of depression. Even the non-diabetic patients with major depression often have insulin resistance, which may persist even after treatment of depression is successful. The certain mechanistic underpinnings of that is reduced insulin transport into the brain through the blood-brain barrier and the glucose deprivation, which may lead to the impairment in brain function. And that impairment, of course, individually affects the brain. In some people, it manifests as a cognitive impairment or decline or depression. And um, the detrimental effects on behavior influence the quality of the glycemic control, making um, the notion of recognizing insulin resistance in patients with the uh, neurological and psychiatric illnesses all too important. So there are a number of other uh, major risk factors because of which it's really truly uh, paramount for us to identify insulin resistance early, and that is the risk for dementia. As we know, dementia is a very uh, growing pro pro problem and uh, will reach epidemic proportion in a uh, couple of decades, and it's one of the most horrible illnesses which robs the person of their individual memory and tremendously disrupts the family and society. So. Age is one of the main critical risk factors for cognitive decline, but what is becoming more and more evident that having insulin resistance may impair cognition at a younger age and now even at an age when people are not at all or decades removed from the uh, age-related risk for cognitive impairment. I will uh, move on to the next slide to show you that uh, data from one of our older studies, which was published um, three year, four years ago now, looking at the insulin resistance as it's measured in the blood in the um, state of the science form, which is called um, SSPG, or a, it's a basically an insulin clamp, and the cognitive performance in patients who had history of depressive disorders. You could see that there were a number of individuals who were younger than age 45. So the mean age was 48, but ranges were from 19 to 71, and I will tell you why it's important. Those were well-educated people who were not currently depressed, and um, they, a lot of them were, in fact, insulin resistant. The weight in these individuals was also ranging between 19 and 49, which is a wide range, but the mean of, uh, a of weight in those individuals was in the overweight category. So what we saw here was that um, the non-diabetic adults of pretty wide age range, both genders, who had a history of mood disorder and were cognitively intact had, uh, had been evaluated for the 
correlation between the extent of their insulin secretion and glucose utilization and specific cognitive performance on, in various models. So in one of the models, we looked at the effects specifically of the clamp on the cognitive performance, and in another, we looked at the effects of the weight. And just to remind the listeners again, uh, as I said before, there is no 100% linear correlation between the weight and the insulin resistance. So what we found was that um, correlations were differing by the age group. In individuals who were 45 and older, and I will start with the right part of the slide, being more overweight was uh, significantly associated with a change in executive function as measured by the um, FSIQ uh, subtest. But being insulin resistant in those older adults was not predictive of any problems on the cognitive performance. Whereas in individuals ages 19 to 45, so those were very young adults, those had the opposite effect where being overweight was not associated with any cognitive performance, but being insulin resistant was associated with problems in the same test of cognitive flexibility. So to conclude from this study and to kind of make a take-home message point is that young individuals who have insulin resistance may have worsened cognitive performance, even if it's within age-related norm, in the absence of the weight gain, whereas being obese in the older age is associated with worse cognitive performance, even in the absence of this metabolic dysfunction uh, of insulin resistance. Moving along uh, to disorders of affective regulation or depressive illnesses. So there are a number of studies done in our lab and many other labs uh, over the years, over the last 15 years, which uh, accumulate a certain number of uh, experiments and contribute to the evidence that patients with depression may in fact have a profound contribution of the insulin resistance to their illness. Uh, one of the more intriguing and, and uh, kind of difficult things to accept is that the age at which insulin resistance may affect mood disorders actually also moving, unfortunately, to the younger age. And the study, which I will not show yet because it's still ongoing, suggests that even in adolescents with depression, we can see already neural correlates of insulin resistance. But for now, it would suffice to say that insulin resistance is often accompanied by depressive symptomatology and that patients with depression have biomarkers associated with insulin resistance. So the next question would be naturally, okay, so if there is this uh, an overlapping pathophysiological platform, what would happen if we treat the patient uh, with depression for the insulin resistance. So what would happen if we tried to resolve insulin resistance in depressed individuals? And I will show you here the study which we published um, a few years ago as well on the add-on of the PPARG agonist, which is the uh, insulin sensitizing agent. In this case, it was pioglitazone versus placebo in patients who had in fact been treated for depression and remained depressed despite being treated for it. What we found was simple. Basically, if, if you add PPARG agonist to the treatment as usual for depression, over three months period, there is a, an appreciable decline in the depression severity. And so a lot of patients respond uh, to that medication. So therefore, there is a improvement in depressive symptomatology as a result of reduction in insulin resistance. 
What is even more interesting that there is an, an age effect back to the just previously mentioned study on the age-related cognitive performance. The age effect in this, uh, in this study was that the younger individuals respond better, so there is a, a more enhanced improvement in depression severity in a younger group than in those who were a little bit older. Now, I will move, move that um, goalpost a little bit further and talk about the biomarkers of stress and the allostatic load as they may underlie the responses and, the, and be a mechanistic goalpost for the prediction of the response to the uh, resolving insulin resistance in disorders of, of brain. Telomeres have been on, at the forepost of the research for the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, they were discovered by Elizabeth Blackburn here at UCSF, for which she received the Nobel Prize. We all know that telomeres are basically the caps of the regular chromosomes. They are uh, known to be associated with accelerated um, aging and could be a biomarkers of multiple processes associated with premature aging. Of course, one of the processes we would talk about today would be inflammation and oxidative stress and insulin resistance. And so there, there are multiplicity of various studies suggesting that telomeres are a viable and fairly easy obtainable predictor for the uh, effects of the cardiovascular disease or diabetes or dementia in the brain, especially in older individuals. But again, looking at the younger individuals in trying to uh, provide a, an individualized approach targeting the, these processes early in life. So we looked at the telomeres, and I will move again the slide. Um, without necessarily going into the details of this, but um, just to show another study which was published from the lab on the telomere links as a predictor of response to this pioglitazone, the PPARG agonist, in patients with unremitted depression. So in the same study which I was describing a few minutes ago, basically we measured the uh, telomere links in patients prior to them being treated and examine the correlation between that length of telomeres and insulin resistance status at baseline and then uh, at the end of the study. So what we found was that there was uh, a, a, a positive correlation between the telomere length and insulin resistance at baseline. What it really means is that people who have who exhibit metabolic dysfunction have already shorter telomeres, therefore um, having a bigger allostatic load and risk for accelerated aging. Furthermore, we found that those who had longer telomeres at baseline improved better in depression severity in the group assigned to the uh, pioglitazone, but not necessarily in placebo. So that kind of suggests that allostatic load is reduced by the improvement in the metabolic dysfunction, and that the biomarker of allostatic load could be a significant and, and accurate predictor for that response. Overall, to say, that it also helps patients with depression to receive um, a better treatment and to be hopefully uh, more protected from the premature brain aging. So to take it together, I would say that there are a number of complexities which I was just kind of lightly touching and giving you a sample menu today on the interactions among various systems and um, pathways, which ultimately result in the three main um, maladaptive uh, 
um, conditions. Those are diseases of effective regulation, which is depression, the cognitive function, which may independently lead to dementia, and the metabolic dysfunction, which may lead to all, all of the above, plus diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So the notion before the scientists right now is to really try to untie those connections and to understand where in an individualized medicine approach we can address the negative effects of stress and try to protect individuals from a risk of developing any or either of these illnesses. For, for the um, practitioners, I guess would be an important take-home message is an, identific an, uh, excuse me, an identification of patients who might be at risk. And uh, the identification in the psychiatric office is, of course, not the easy one, but for the private practitioners who are in the primary care field or internal medicine field, or even the neurology field, that would be a, uh, a viable way of measuring the proxy marker, which is not requesting even a blood draw, uh, and that is the assessment of the central adiposity. If you recall the slide I was showing in the very beginning of the adipose tissues actively secreting free fatty acids and potentially leading to the insulin resistance, the central adiposity is one of the more accurate biomarkers of, uh, of metabolic dysfunction with the vast literature now uh, supporting the predictive value in a risk for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and uh, even uh, CNS illnesses. The easiest way to do it is to measure the waist circumference, and the you can see here the um, abdominal obesity or that central adiposity definitions, which com comply with the notion of the metabolic syndrome, uh, widely used in various um, assessments of individuals at risk. Um, the other way to assess for the presence of insulin resistance is really uh, a lab work done in the morning for the fasting plasma glucose and fasting plasma insulin, which yields what is known as a homeostatic model assessment ratio, or HOMA, and that could be easily obtained in any lab. Those um, targets would be an appropriate primary therapeutic target and should be a part of the multifaceted assessment of the disease, whether it's an illness of the central nervous system or the primary cardiovascular or diabetes uh, pathology. Finally, treatment of outcomes in mood disorders should anticipate a probability of less favorable outcome in individuals who also have a concomitant metabolic dysfunction. And I think that um, that would kind of make a, a much better solution for those who treat patients with mood disorders for months and years without much success, because I think that uh, assessment for, in, for the individual metabolic function may yield an optimal result in um, management of the de of depression. So uh, non-pharmacologically, we think of uh, interventions associated with diet, exercise, and stress reduction. Now we, we, we can provide or at least offer for consideration the pathophysiological platform trying to justify the use of these uh, very commonly advised interventions. and uh, to create a direction for future studies looking at the specific molecular targets in the brain and peripherally as a result of stress reduction, exercise, or diet. So this probably would uh, be sufficient to finish. I just want to kind of uh, acknowledge people who work in lab and who uh, contributed to this research as well as collaborators in our uh, vast research network of uh, centers around the world and the specific group of people 
I mentioned here represent the uh, network which we now uh, actively working in, and it's called psychopathology and allostatic load across the lifespan of PALS, uh, with participation from Rockefeller, Mount Sinai, South Carolina, John Hopkins, Toronto, um, UCSF, UCLA, University of Michigan, and the University of Amsterdam. So with that, I will stop and take questions. Thank you, Dr. Raskon, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So, let's get started. Our first question is, what are the common underlying mechanisms among 3D? So the 3D, which uh, to again reiterate the diabetes, dementia, and depression, are all guided by the maladaptive uh, allostatic load and uh, conditions of metabolic dysfunction such as insulin resistance, oxidative stress, and uh, inflammation. Today we were discussing specifically the insulin resistance as the um, example of those underlying mechanisms, but certainly the uh, inflammatory cytokines, the uh, biomarkers of oxidative stress, and others are also um, a common pathogenic platforms uh, under all these three major illnesses. How does insulin resistance manifest in central nervous system diseases? So that's a great question because uh, we still, as I said in my lecture, uh, and, I, and I hope that I was able to really emphasize that point, that uh, insulin resistance in humans at this point is measured in the peripheral blood. And what we are trying to assess are the neural correlates in uh, various models of psychopathology, for example, in patients who have dementia or patients who have MCI or in patients who have depression, uh, bipolar disorder, etc. So um, we're looking at the changes in the uh, neural biomarkers such as, uh, for example, regional metabolism in various uh, regions of interest which are implicated in these diseases or the connectivity between the main networks responsible for the cognitive per selective cognitive performance or affective regulation such as hippocampus, say, prefrontal uh, cortex, etc. So uh, the effects of insulin resistance in the brain per se still await um, development of more precise ways of measuring it in, in vivo in a human, and um, that's one of the main intense uh, research areas um, our lab, our network, and many other networks around the world are focused on. And Dr. Razgon, it looks like we have time for one more question. What happens to the central nervous system if insulin resistance is treated? So that's, that's again, um, kind of a question which is answered at this point. Uh, with the, with the assessment of the peripheral insulin resistance, but what we do see nowadays is that there, there are certain improvements in connectivity, for example, between the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex, understanding that those are major pathways subserving the emotional regulation and cognition, uh, executive function, uh, attention, etc. So we can say that by resolving insulin resistance, we might improve the um, collaborate, collaborative work of various um, pathways in the brain. What we don't know yet is whether it happens in the periphery independent from the central nervous system. And we do know that whether 
we understand it fully or not, but insulin itself as a hormone is a very important uh, neuroprotective agent in the brain. And so we would be very interested to, to, to assess accurately the neuroprotective effects of insulin in specific areas, regions in the brain, but that is something we need to um, try to, to answer in the future with the development of more sophisticated individualized precision medicine assessments. I would like to once again thank Dr. Rascon for her presentation. I would also like to thank Labyrinth for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through June of 2018. You will receive an email from Labyrinth letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.